20, it says this. Jesus talking, he says, I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall not enter. In no case enter the kingdom of heaven. This is another one of those scriptures that's a showstopper. The sons of Zadok to me, that's a showstopper. Do you want to minister to them? Me, if you want to minister to the people, it's a showstopper. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. That's a, that's a showstopper. Right? That's a pause. That's a moment of pause. Like, I really need to stop and make sure what I'm doing is the Lord. And this is another one of those that just stops you in your track. This is that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You'll in no case have the kingdom. So our righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees in the, in the, in the Sadducees and the scribes. And that's a pretty tall order because we know Paul described himself in Philippians 3. He said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Is keeping the law blameless? Think about that. Anybody ever been deep into their Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? Are you reading all the law? Yeah. You ever thought of, you ever stopped and thought about, wow, they had to do this just like that? It'd be easy to miss some of that. But Paul said he was blameless. Blameless. And yet here Jesus is introducing something different. He's saying, except your righteousness exceed. In other words, he's talking about something completely different. Something completely new. And in Matthew 5, when Jesus is talking to the people and goes to the Beatitudes, talks about blessed is blessed is the peacemaker, blessed is the meek, blessed are those who persecute. He goes on and he goes on and begins to say that uh, in, in verse 20, he repeats it again. And I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, who in no case live the kingdom of heaven. You've heard said of them that you shall not kill. Whoever shall kill will be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause will be in danger of judgment. Whoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever shall say thy fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore I bring your gift to the altar in that remembrance. And you remember that your brother have also all against you, then leave your gift before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Verse 27, you have heard about it has been said of them of old time, you shall not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whoever will look upon a woman who lust after her, commit adultery with her already in her heart. And if you're right, I, I offend you, pluck it out and cast it away, for it's profitable that one of your members shall perish. And your whole body cast out hell. And he goes on and on. Saying, it's, you've been told this, but this is what I say. You've been told divorce is okay, but this is what I say. You've been told to hate your enemy, but this is what I say. He's taking everything to a whole other level. He's taking it right out of the realm of our possibility. Is that not right? You see, you have to, you have to really look at this from the right heart. If you're on the ground of Calvary, when you begin to read this, you begin to sense what he's doing. If not, you begin to read this in sin. And, and all that speaks to you is condemnation. All that speaks to you is defeat. Either that or it's going to speak to you spiritual pride. Like the Pharisees and the scribes. Oh, I can do this. I can do this. But Jesus takes it to another level. And he's not being cruel because he's known where he's going. Remember this clearly. Remember when Jesus, you've heard me say this before, when Jesus was talking about the Beatitude, love your brother. Don't look upon him. You cannot be if you hate your brother, you're in danger of hell. All these things he's saying. If you don't see these in the light of this, that Jesus is here in Matthew 5, and he knows where he's going. He knows this is where I'm going. I'm going to the cross. He knows I'm going to make all this possible through the cross. This is why he brings up the scribes and the Pharisees. Because if not, it would just compound it even more. Jesus wasn't there saying, you see these scribes and Pharisees? You have to double down on the law. You have to double down on what's going out here. You going on here. You have to try ten times harder. You know what he's saying? He's bringing, he's bringing the standard clearly there because he knows that they need to see it. This is the standard. And the standard is Jesus. The standard is Jesus. The one who never seen. This is God's standard. And the only way to hit that standard is with the identification of Jesus. Is that beginning to dawn on some of you now? It's not imitation. 
It's identification. And that comes by the Spirit. Religion is always an is imitation. <clears throat> you can be a better Christian. You can try harder. How many of you say that? How many times I hear Christians say, I've just got to try harder. And that's not the right thing to say. I've got to do better is not our cry. Our cry needs to be, I'm dead. Give me Christ. Amen. I put on the new man. We've got to see that. <coughs> we've got to understand that and walk. But we've also got to see that God has His standard. And the standard is Jesus. And this is important for the time we're living in. Because we can't try to bring the standard down to us. Amen. When Jesus finished up this whole uh, dissertation in Matthew 5, He ends with these words in verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that word perfect translates immature. It means whole. It means complete. It means absolute. Amen. That's what it means. Now, that's not to try to discount. I've heard preachers preach them. It doesn't mean perfect. It means mature. He's not really requiring that. But he is requiring that. Because Jesus is the standard. But he knows where he's going. Amen. He knows where he's headed. And you see, this is the gospel. This is in its, in its purest form. Is it our God and our own selves is unreachable because of our sin. Amen. That we have we have we have signed that agreement with the devil in the garden. He's won the lease over to this land. That the rebellious nature becomes part of, of men and women. And they can't break out of it on their own. It's impossible. You can never get back to that standard. That fellowship is broken. And then Jesus comes. And then he makes these kind of statements, which if you don't receive them right, it looks strange. It's like it's like these people, they're already, they're already had 400 years of silence. They're already so separated through their religion and their sin. And now you're holding this standard up. And he's doing it for a reason, because he says we're going somewhere. This is where you've arrived at. You've arrived at love your friends, hate your enemies. You've arrived at it, 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 that at any time you want, you can get divorced. You've arrived at that your heart can be filled with lust, and it's okay if you don't ever take action on it. You've arrived at this kind of, that, that you can be angry at your brother and it's okay. But I'm telling you that I'm bringing the truth into the human hearts. I'm bringing the truth to the heart. I'm going to heal the heart. Amen? This is why we don't have rule of repentance. <coughs> and it's what we need to believe for. Will you believe with me this morning for rule repentance? Amen. I've been at this for a while. I've probably been guilty of some of this myself, and I've certainly seen others where, where it's just, you're going to sugarcoat the gospel and water it down and just try to make it easier, and people aren't really healed. Or you're going to get up and you're just going to be harsher. Just preach a little louder. Just preach a little meaner. Just, just put the law in bigger, bolder letters in people's faces and, and try to drive them into repentance. It doesn't work. Repentance comes by faith, amen? It comes by faith. As many, as some of you have repented, as others have kind of come in as they begin to repent, there's, there's not going to be anybody standing there saying, we did this. Well, how could you possibly do it? You can't do it. How many of you have been going along your way and all of a sudden God, God reveals something to you and He brings His people away? What about David? Have you ever thought about David? I mean, I mean David's sin with Bathsheba. There's the child. David's going on with his life. De you know, he... His, his, his brother's soldier's already been killed and put in the ground. He's just going along. Everything's fine. And yet, the word of the Lord comes to him and says, you're the man. And in a moment, in a moment, repentance comes. How we sing that song in, 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 in Psalm 51. How beautiful it starts. Cleanse me with hiss of God and I'll be clean. It's David's cry. David's saying, don't wash me on the outside. Don't make me clean on the outside. Don't give me any religious fervor. Do something in my heart. David knew it wasn't simply, oh, I just made a little sin. David knew, correct what caused me to sin. God. Amen? What a beautiful thing of repentance. And we can't move off of that. If we have faith this morning, if we're really preaching the gospel of faith, if we're really feel that God's saying go from faithfulness to faith, we've got to believe for real repentance. Amen? We've got to believe for it. And it doesn't come by, by, by condemning the sinner. It doesn't come by, by, by serving the the, God, the coding the gospel. It comes by faith. We've got to believe for God to touch that heart. Yeah. Because only God can do that. Only God can touch the heart. How sweet it is 
How sweet it is. How many of you have experienced this? How sweet it is God touches something in your life. You, you, you didn't even know what was going on. He touches something. And you're like, oh my gosh. You're convicted. It hurts. It's sharp. It might even produce tears. But yet you're encouraged. Why? Because you know, God loves me. God loves me. Maybe your wife missed it. Maybe you missed it and you're searching in your prayers. Maybe a brother who really loves you in the past that's even comforting you, correcting you. Maybe he doesn't. He maybe missed it, but God didn't miss it. It's so beautiful. You see, these are the scribes and the Pharisees. The scribes were the were the lawgivers. They copied the law and, and they had the law written out perfectly. You ever meet people like that? It's like I just obey the law. I do what everything is said. But usually, those people have no heart about it. Amen. Where's the heart? And Phariseeism, that's when we fall into to hypocrisy. Jesus told the crowd, He said, listen, the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Because Jesus understood authority, did He not? They sit in the seat of Moses. So do what they say. But don't do what they do. Look at their actions. Amen? Watch their actions. See what they're doing. This is where, this is where He said, bring fruit that is meant for repentance. Or when John the Baptist saw the, the, the Pharisees and the, and, 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 the, and the ones coming. He said, listen, He warned you to free from the wrath to come. Bring fruit. Fruit meant for repentance. In other words, God wants fruit. Not just saying, I'm sorry. Not just tears. Not just being sorry something happened, but the very reason for it. Amen? That's why it says in Hebrews that we have fathers who corrected us after their own pleasure. We like to think as fathers and we all corrected perfectly. But, you know, I'm on the other side of that and got grandkids now and I look back and I certainly did try. But I'm sure at times I didn't always get it right. Yes? And the one thing I always wanted to try to do is don't just correct to get the child to stop this action or that action. I want God to touch that heart. Amen? I want to know what's going on in that heart. That's why we don't have time for that today. I'm going to tell you, you can ask my wife, there's times I've spent hours with the child because that child just wouldn't wouldn't give in, wouldn't repent. Right? I'm not talking about, about brokenness where, where someone's someone's defeated, but where they acknowledge, I'm wrong. Amen? This is what God wants. I always knew I had the child's heart when they would repent, say they're sorry, and then they'd look back up at me and I could see eye to eye and there, there's no condemnation. We don't have time for that. In fact, not to go into all this, but all the children are being raised by, by other people. Amen? They're all being raised by other people. It takes time, amen? It takes time to raise them. It takes time. That's why God made women the way they made That nurturing, and that caring, and those things. I know people get in trouble for it today, but I'm sorry. There's just certain parts of it that only a mother can do. There's certain parts that only a father can do. takes time. Now some people say that I'm not that patient. I had a young maid in my office this morning helping my printer and said, Brother Frank, you need to be more patient. I was hoping she would see. But I'm a little bit more patient than I used to be. But I can tell you, you can imagine when I was a young businessman and I didn't have God, before I had eight children and got out of business and all that, I didn't have any patience. Now, I'm probably not that patient today. But I tell you, I've come a long way. And I'll tell you one thing that helped that having those kids was God getting in my life. Saying, Lord, I don't want this life. You have to stop. And you have to give all the time to use the to be able to That's how much God loves us. Amen? That's how much God loves us. And one of the reasons, and I say this with, with some carefulness and with love, one reason that we don't have as much repentance in the church and so many are questioning God's love is because we don't have God's correction. Amen? I know my parents loved me because they corrected me. And yes, they said they loved me. And yes, they provided me. And yes, they were good folks, but they corrected me. Now, some of you, it's difficult for you to picture this, but, but <clears throat> and I came with a lot of brothers. I needed a little bit of correction when I was little. A little bit. But they loved me. Yep. I got enough of it. Yeah. And so that's why we struggle today. And so I'm, I'm setting, I'm setting the, 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 the starting point for things that God wants to do. 
Jesus is holding up the standard. I want you to see this. Can you see it this morning? He's not being cruel. He's saying, this is the standard. You've been left alone for 400 years and this is what you came up with. This is my standard. When the, when the disciples were eating with unwashed hands, uncouth brutes that they were, they were eating with unwashed hands and the Pharisees came and said, listen, they're eating with unwashed hands. Because it was symbolic washing in the Pentateuch and in the law. But these guys, they just because they've got nothing else to do, it's not built a relationship, they just go on and on and on. That's why the law didn't work. Amen? The Bible says a woman's long hair is her glory. I believe that. But you're going to make that a law? Especially overseas at times. And I, I, I've run into legalistic groups. Like, well, a woman's hair has to be long. Well, how long? You're going to spend all your time on it? How long till she trips over? You know what I'm saying? There's a principle there. And you focus on the wrong thing. This is why they were focused till they were... It says that they, they took and had the washing of pots. They, these guys are spending all day on washing stuff. <laughs> washing the tables. If you read about some of the old old uh, 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 sex they had, even about the time when, when Jesus was coming, they built they literally built their rooms where these Pharisees would be at. And they, they had... Larry, you would love this. They had slight gradation in the room and they had holes in the wall where water could come in and wash all the floors. It was just an engineering marvel. And that's what they focused on. See, we want a holiness that, that is all about a relationship with Jesus. Not a holiness that focuses on who's being holy and who's not. When there's a true holiness, you're not judging everybody else and what they're doing. You're letting that holiness work inside of you. And so they said, how come they eat with one more chance? Jesus said, listen, you've discounted the Word of God by your traditions. He said, Moses said in the law, if you, you're disrespectful to your parents, you curse your parents, you should die the death. But you say, if, you, if they have needs, you tell them, I, gave, I dedicated that to the temple. I don't have to help you. I want you to think about it. That's another showstopper, isn't it? Wow. When's the last time you heard a message on that? Was Jesus being cruel again, saying, listen, if there's anybody out there that's cursed their parents, I want them to die. He's not doing that. He's shedding the standard again. He's saying, you're down here worrying about what you're washing. I go straight to the heart. You've actually set aside your parents. Do you think maybe that's a problem today in our society? Even Christians disrespectful of their parents? Not taking care of their parents? See, that's another thing that takes patience. Amen? My kids are already arguing about me. Well, Dad's here for a long time. Who's going to have to deal with him? You know what I'm saying? At least they know they're going to have to. So he sets his standard. But he knows where he's going. Amen? He knows where he's going. Where's he going? He's going to the cross. Do you see his heart? If you look at a woman in lust, or a community, if you hate your brother, because he's trying to wake him up, he's trying to get him to see, look, Moses gave you the law. What was before the law? Abraham. The law came so you'd know the sinfulness of sin. Amen? Was sin present before the law? Yes. The law just came and let you know you can't do it. And then they have 400 years of silence. So Jesus is coming in with all their, all their rules and all their regulations. Everything that they do. And He says, look, this is all a matter of the heart. You're worried about washing pots, but in your hearts, you won't even take care of your parents. Let's get things in the right way. He knows where He's going. And where's He going? He's going to that cross. And what's that cross going to do? That cross is going to mean that He's going to pay the cross. As a propitiation of our sins, meaning the substance of He's going to be the perfect man. Right? He's going to be the perfect man. He's going to die sinless. The Father's going to turn His face away. And at some point, at some point, in, in celestial moments, at some point, the Father was like, when was it? Was it when Jesus said he was it's finished? I don't know. Was it on the first day, the second day, the third day, the Father goes? I'm, I'm very careful with this, right? I'm, I'm just I'm just telling you that the things that, that we feel like, that with these words jump out of us again. That's why I really don't like people portraying Jesus and trying to, to, to do all that, right? Not to get into that, it's fine if you're blessed by that, but to me it's just beyond me. 
But at some moment, the father said, At some moment, Peter, who denied the Lord, right? Who failed in all those ways. At some moment, he knew. I forgive. He didn't say I need to do better. He didn't say I need to try for it. He was doing it. Jesus was going to love. We were worshiping this morning. And I'm up here worshiping, right? Trying not to get, get too so I didn't go too fast because we'll see Jake get mad at me. So I'm trying to be up here. I worship God and behave myself. And God spoke to me. Clear as anything I said. Do not underestimate the victory of the cross. I just thought that. I don't know how to continue. Knowing what I was going to preach. Do not. Do not underestimate the power of the cross. Amen. That person said, but I am beset by love. And I don't know what to do. And I'll never make it. Do not underestimate the power of the cross. Do you see it? It's not magic. You don't just need... And get somebody to pray for you. You don't just need somebody to pray for you necessarily. God wants you. It doesn't mean you've got to spend an hour on your knees. Although that may be God, what God wants. I don't know. But it all comes down to this. Faith in the finished work of the cross. Amen. 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 I come into your presence and once again I see that the blood is you. Do you think... You know, I've written hundreds of songs. And most of the songs I've written weren't written because I was like, I want to write a song. It would be on, in prayer. Maybe I'm in a chair. Maybe I'm down on my knees and I'm before the Lord and I just start singing. Because that's what I'm saying is, Lord, I'm coming into your presence and once again I see your blood. It's enough. I'm here. I'm here. I feel your love. I feel your presence. I feel your excitement. I feel your life. I know it's here. And I, I, I know I'm unworthy, but your blood is enough. Amen. So this is why, this is why people don't experience the love of God. This is why we don't have real repentance. Because we need to hold up the truth. This is what God requires. But I can't do that. Look to Jesus. Then you've got to look to Him. Do you see that Jesus didn't say, look, I'm here now, so it doesn't matter. You know, get your bumper sticker that says that, that, that God's not finished with you yet. You know, whatever, it's all okay. He holds us up. And, and either either there's faith, either Christ is walking in the faith that the Father is sitting on, or He's cruel. And I know my God's not cruel. Somebody say, because He knows where He's going. He's trying to break them free. First, they have to know. Listen, you think you're okay? How many believers are, are there out there that says, "I'm fine, I'm fine," but they're living their own life. They're living their own life. Jesus is my Savior, but He's not my Lord. It's okay. He's not Lord of everything. I'm okay. A.W. Tozer, you've heard me quote, he wrote a book said, I call it heresy. And I call it heresy too. To say, He's my Savior, He's not my Lord. It's not right. It says in Isaiah 29, 13, Therefore the Lord said, For as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth, with, and their lips do honor me, but they remove their heart from, from far, far from me, and the fear toward me is taught by the precepts of me. Once again, it doesn't mean we don't come to Him and we don't lift our hearts in praise if we're not perfect. But see, that's where the brokenness of worship comes. You come to praise Him, you know, Lord, this is what my lips say. I want my heart to match this. Please. Amen. But it's taught by the precepts of men. Where's the fear of God taught? In Bible schools. Where's the fear of God taught? In the Bible studies. Where is the fear of God taught? On a Sunday morning for a pulpit. And the fear of God is taught here. In the presence, in the presence of the King. Amen. In the presence of the King. In 2 Kings 17, it's talking about Samaria when they were captured. He's talking about that they... They drank from all the people that are around them. Do you know why God said He'd drive out all the enemies in Canaan? He didn't want any of that mixture. You know, you got to be kind of radical to begin with. I like what Oswald Chambers says where he, when the Scripture says, uh, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your arm offends you, cut it off. Oswald Chambers says, we've all got to be a radical at some point. But He doesn't want us going through life maimed. The point being, at some time you have to be a radical, Sometimes you have to throw everything out. I'm glad when I first got saved, 
threw out my record collection and all this stuff. No one was there saying, that's too much. It's like, no, all this is the wrong stuff for me. It's all got to go. It's true, I'm a musician. I love playing the Lord. But when I got saved, I put my guitar up. You said, why? Because I was a new creation. I put it up. I thought, I'll never play it again. Because I'm new. And God gave it back. God didn't want all that to creep in. And you know, when I was younger, there was the men I listened to preach in the They were upset about many of the false doctrines that were out there, false teaching at the time. False teachings of name it, claim it, hyper faith, prosperity, all these things. I could go on and on. There were false teachings and the preachers preaching against it. But it's interesting today. That was some years and years ago. There's no false teachings out there now. And the reason is, is because so much of the philosophies have simply seeped in. There's no real controversy, is there? It used to be people would want to talk about holiness or this or that. There's a little bit of controversy, but it was okay because, because people were pressing in with what God wants. Maybe someone didn't agree with you, but it's okay, you're both pressing in. Now it just doesn't matter. No one really cares. Because we wound up in Second Kings, where it says they feared the Lord and served their own gods after manners of the nations who they had carried them away. They feared God and served them and serve their own gods. How is that possible? How can you fear God and serve other gods? Well, you can't. Because it's a superficial fear. But you're still serving God. You're still serving God. Amen? Sometimes we have idols in our lives, don't we? You know what an idol is? It's like, I'm not, I don't want that touched. Amen? I'll give up everything, but not that. I'm not going to let this be touched. Not this, not this position, not this privilege, not relationship, not this bank account, not this this whatever it is. Even sometimes our hurt, our feelings, right? I need this. Sometimes we're afraid to get healed. That's why Jesus asked people, do you want to be healed? Have ever been, anybody ever been hurt or angry about something? And you know you got to forgive and you're like, I think I'll hang on to it for a while. Mm-hmm. Once again, I know you've heard this a hundred times, but I'm Italian and you know, there's like a lot of vendetta problems, right? My wife will be like, you need to let go of that now. And I'm like, I'm going to. I'm going to. I mean, it should be immediate. Mm. But it's like, hey, let me just hang on to this for a minute. These are idols. Yeah. It doesn't mean God, God wants us broke. God wants us destitute. But it means God wants us in a place where all that's laid down. But we're living in a time where it's like, I can fear God, I can serve God, but He's not going to be everything. We settle down with that. Like, look, you're going to minister to people in two different ways. You're going to minister to those who really want God, and those that don't don't really want God, you're going to kind of help them out. But look to you. People can be on the peripheral edge here, and that's fine, and that's okay. And we're going to love everybody no matter where they're at. But we're going to stand for this. All for Jesus. All for Him. And we're not going to back away from the standard. But we're preaching the cross, are we not in here? Jesus, Jesus was preaching the cross this way. Old Testament. This way. Do you understand that? Now you see David, when David said, sacrifice and offerings you don't care about, he's going to make them, but he knew what they represented. Think about it. The crowds out there, they get the ram, or the scapegoat, they're going to cut its neck, the blood's going to flow, and people are just going through the motions. But maybe there's Levi over here, or Abraham over here, or Leah over here, or Sarah over here, or somebody in the crowd, and they're, and they're like, that's God's promise. That's God's promise. That's not just blood. That represents, that represents God's salvation to us. God will forgive me. When that priest goes in there, I'm forgiven. But how many did that just became a ritual? That's why I don't like to, when someone says, what time is your service? I know it's pedantic. But I don't like that. It's like we don't have a service where we just go and have a service and everybody says, we're going to have a gathering. We have a moment. We have an event where we're going to get a hold of God. Amen. Yes. Yes. He was headed towards that cross. We've got to see that. And we can't be afraid of repentance. Amen. Some of you get discouraged because you're like, well, I've repented of this a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times. Just keep repenting. 
God's cut up and really is he, has he said that to you? I come into your presence and once again I say, that's your grace and mercy is all. Because his mercy and his grace. Amen. I mean, I hate to say it, being saved as long as I am and all, but sometimes, sometimes I feel like, man, this battle with the flesh gets worse. Amen. But God knows. Do you see that difference? It's either saying, this is the way I am and God understands and I'm just going to bounce along until I get to heaven and it's just this messy grace. Or you're on the other side where it's like, we've got to be holy and if I start to be really harsh and mean to everybody because I'm holier than them and, and angry because people aren't holy, I've told you that. That's what's going to start happening. We're going to water down the gospel and there's going to be preachers out there and you can't really blame them if they're going to preach meaner and harsher and harsher because their hearts are going to be so broken for the sin. But the way we've got to preach is, this is the standard. What's the standard? Jesus. He's perfect. And He wants you to be perfect. Well, I can't be. That's right. Identification. Does those scriptures make sense now when Jesus says, I'm in the Father and He's in me. And I'm in Him. And you're in me. What the heck are you talking about? What does it mean to be in Jesus? Oh, to think like Him. No. What does it mean to be in Jesus? To try to imitate Him. No. What does it mean to be in Jesus? Some mystical experience. No. It's faith. says, I'm in Jesus. How do you know that? By faith. You see, this is where our teachings are so good up to a point. Because it just takes faith. It takes faith. I, I can't explain to you that in a flow chart. That when the Father looks down, when I go into the, into the Father's presence, here I am, Father. I'm going to ask in your name directly because Jesus said I could. And the Father looks at me. And he sees Jesus. I mean, I can explain it doctrinally because Jesus took our place. He was a perpetuation of our sins. When He died, He was the sacrifice. I can take you through all the Old Testament, through all the Pentateuch, and I can show you all the, all the similes and metaphors of all, all the sacrifices. Yes, yes, I do study. I can show you all that. But at the end of the day, it takes faith boldly to come in. That's why I said, how many backsliders? It breaks my heart. They're just like, no, I'm not worthy to go in. Come on! Just go in. Take your filthy rags. Take your sin, take it whatever. Well, God can't stand sin. That's right, He can't. So get into His presence. And He'll grant you repentance. And you can repent of all that. Amen? I first came back from the mission field. I met a brother in Home Depot or somewhere. He had been through some bad times in the past. Loved God. He had been back to for quite a while. I simply said, Brother, I'm not in the church. I said, Brother, I'm just so tired of seeing men thrown on the wayside. I'm tired of passing men laying on the wayside. It's not right. He showed up to church. Began to get his life right with God. Still serving God to this day. This is what God wants in him. I mean, when I was a young man, I heard preachers preach like a house of fire. Preach about God's holiness. Preach about the awesomeness of God. Preach about the repentance. Well, it, it never condemned me. It always excited me. Like, yes. Yes. Amen. This, this is our God. This is why we worship Him. This is where real worship comes in. In the presence of one greater than you, you worship. The lepers came. The, the, the nine left. The one came back and worshiped. This is where we worship. The woman, after she was healed with the issue of blood, fell down and worshiped. Peter fell down on his knees before the Lord and said, Depart from me. I'm a sinful man. They worshiped. This is where we need to start. People meeting Jesus with worship. Then you should introduce music. Right? Can you see how that would be? Then people would be like, I've been worshiping at home. I've been singing at home. Yeah. Like I said, when I first got saved, didn't even have my guitar. I told, told you last week, I'd go to my office early. I'd get up early and try to race there to my showroom before the ones went in. And I would just, I would just go in, all in and out between the products, just singing my head off. Singing my head off. No instruments. Then you add instruments. How beautiful is that? What we need to do is unplug all the instruments and say, let's worship. How beautiful you hear this. That's not to say music's bad. We'll talk about that another time. This is a music book, ain't it? But that worship's there. Do you see that? God wants that repentance. Yes. Look, look in the book of 1 of Corinthians. That church is... Is, is so off in so many ways and they have a brother who's in incest, in, in incest with, with a, a stepmother and it's, it's, it's a mess and Paul has to he says I don't compliment you I'm upset with y'all this is wrong he says 
turn that one over to Satan that 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 his, his that his soul would be saved. It seemed harsh. Then when you see Second Corinthians two, he said, "Listen, y'all need to bring that one back in the church." Why? Because look, he's he's in repentance. You're going to make him go from repentance into discouragement, and I don't want that. Can you see the beauty of God there? God's after restoration. But for that, there has to be the correction. Amen? Sometimes we can be stubborn. I think I told you, I've dealt with this before. You know, I was visiting one of my daughters in Arkansas, and one of the little ones just wouldn't respond the way that Mama wanted, a little three-year-old, four-year-old. And Mama's like, you're going to have to say this. The child's just so upset. Mama's dealing with me. It's going on for like 45 minutes. I'm looking at my wife. She's, a, she's the one. You know, moms sometimes, they have to be there with kids all day if they're ever at home with them. But they're there. And my wife, she wouldn't put up with nothing. And my wife's looking at me like, leave it. And I'm like, you sure that child knows what's going on, mama? So we just, you just think, it's going on forever. But I'll give it to my daughter. She never gave up. 45 minutes later, that child still won't be. By that time, it's so long, daddy finally came over. He walked in the door and he said, What's going on here? She said, She just won't obey. He just took the little one by the hand, went into the other room. Five minutes later, a child came out. Repentance is beautiful. The point I'm making is it takes time. See, we don't. Do you ever see yourself like that? Oh, you. You're stubborn. You're stubborn. Is that a bad thing? Because you got opportunity for lots of repentance. Amen. <laughs> yeah. God can use that stubbornness if it goes through the cross. Isn't it? And that, that's why I want to be clear here for what God's going to do. He wants repentance, but it can't be orchestrated. It can't be orchestrated by us trying to convince people to repent. It can't be, it can't be sugar-coated like, it's okay, God doesn't really care. It's got to be, this is the standard Jesus. Well, I'll never live up to that. That's exactly right. That's why He died. That's why we're telling you, bow the knee. Bow to me. See it. It's so glorious. It's so glorious. It's so glorious what God's doing. So once again, to say I gotta do better is not the right cry. The cry is I gotta die. I gotta die and let you live. Amen. The work's been done. It's easy. The only difficulty. Amen. He's our reaction, our will. In the great divorce we see after this talks about the the name heaven. He's got that religion that's actually engraved in die, engraved in his skin. He knows it's gotta go. So it's a simple task. He knows what has to happen, but he's gotta take it. He's gotta cool that thing. Sometimes God requires hard things of us. He requires a lot. But he's there. He's there. He's always there. He's with us. We need to fear repentance. Repentance, it says in Proverbs, is correction is a way of life. So if you come in here, it's like, man, I had a rough week. It seems like God is correcting me every single day. Glory to God. The alternative is you be illegitimate. Amen? Seven father of eight kids. I've got some of them that really gave me a run for my money. But they're the, they're, they're the liveliest, most fun ones I have. Because we were never out to break their spirit. We were out there just to change their will. Amen. Amen. God's going to grab a pit. Just imagine what it will look like for this generation. Wow. I don't want to hear. I don't want to hear about the latest person that got saved, and it's like, man, now I'm just, I'm, 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 I was in the world, but now I'm doing things in Christianity like the world, and, and I'm just showing off my newest Christian tattoo, and I'm doing this. I want to hear, Jesus got a hold of me. I want to hear brokenness, man. Man. I spent time with Jesus. He got a hold of me. And I'm telling you, some of you sit here today, and it's like, I understand, but I never quite get there. It's like, well, you've got to have faith. You've got to have faith. You've got to believe. Amen? 
We're only here for a short time. Let's fulfill what he called us to do. Amen. He did not purchase a portion of you. Amen. CJ's always looking at trucks and all that. CJ would be crazy if CJ comes up. It's like, it's a nice truck you bought, CJ. Where's the bed? There's two doors missing. I gave them the full price, but they only gave me this much. Wow. That's not what Jesus did. He purchased all of you. Every bit of it. This is our walk. Our walk is constantly surrendering all that to him. And when you surrender up this, as you walk, then he wants more again. Then he wants more. As I tell people, I've only been saved about four years or so, I guess, Mary, I don't remember. When we gave up our business, got rid of our cars and the things we owned, and then when we went to the mission field, we, we, we sold everything or gave everything we had away. People say, that's amazing. I don't, I don't think so. Because I have to be honest, that was pretty easy. Yeah. It's when God starts coming along and saying, hey, Frank, you know this little thing over here? That's been yours forever. Yeah, that is mine. I want it. What do you want with that? I want it. Because I want all of it. I purchased all of it. Okay. Every bit of it. It's a nice thing to know. I belong to my God. Doesn't that make you feel good? I belong to my God. People don't like it today. <clears throat> yeah. I belong to my God. There's so much more I want to say this morning. serve God, but still maintain who you are. So I'm saying, that's why marriage is strong. When I got married, I gave myself to that girl. She gave herself to me. Amen. I hear about men who struggle all the time. People say men can't stay faithful and they look other women. I never had a problem with that. Why? That's mine. Anything else would be just strange. Amen. I belong to my God. You say, He owns you? Yeah. Most slave. Yeah. You ever heard that, that scripture in the Old Testament? If you got a slave that comes to the light in the time of Jubilee, if that slave says, It's time that I'm free, but I love my master. I love my master. I want to stay with him. God set me free. I can go live any life I want. Right? As a businessman and all that, I don't, how can I be doing this? I'm going to do this. My master set me free. And I said, I want to be yours. Amen. So you God. God's moving. And we're going to get busier here. And this whole storm just was, was out there just to try to interrupt everything. Man, we've lost a whole week. A week or so, Frankie and I and Jason, we're off. We're coming back in the middle of August. We're going to have a men's breakfast. And that night, we're going to have music night, worship, and then the meeting the next day, I'll tell you, God's head towards an exciting weekend. God's doing things. Amen. He's moving. He wants us ready. Amen. Ready how? In faith. Because He wants you perfect. Be ye perfect. How can you be perfect? Jesus. Somebody just say, just Jesus. That's how. That's how. Identification. Identification. Glory to God. Well, I'll have to stop. Unfortunately. There's more I wanted to say to do. I got a little shook up this morning. God spoke to me in the middle of the word. I got to say it. Don't invest me. The victory. Glory to God. Glory to God. Isn't that beautiful? Outstanding. Outstanding in the the past is gone. Shame is gone. Guilt is gone. See? But I need to hang on a little bit of that. No, no. It's gone. It's gone. We don't get what we deserve. Somebody say, man. See, we start homework from being all over again. That's what I get so excited about. 
I don't get what I deserve. Like, let me get started all over again. All right, let's stop. CJ, come up here. Please. Thank you for that. The people who are. 